Hi there. In week six of the course, we discuss the importance of monitoring trends and developments in terrorism and counterterrorism. And this includes the impact of counterterrorism on societies. We should not only ask if counterterrorism measures work, but also what unintended consequences they might have. But we're very glad to have Professor Tahir Abbas with us today. He is the Chair in Radicalization Studies at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs of Leiden University, so actually a colleague of us, and he has investigated, amongst many other things, the relation between Islamophobia and radicalization. And he's also leading a large European-funded research project in this area. So welcome, Professor Abbas. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Great. So let's start with a focus on terrorism. So you've looked at the link between Islamophobia and radicalization. But can you explain to us how these are linked? Yes. So uh, two concepts that carry with them a quite a considerable degree of weight and an existing uh, thinking. But in terms of how they're related to each other, if we think about Islamophobia as a, a set of structural, cultural, ideological issues in relation to exclusion, isolation, alienation of Muslims, particularly in the West. And if we think of radicalization as both a process and an outcome, we can see how certain anti-Muslim framing in the everyday world that uh, many Europeans find themselves are often sufficient enough to drive some vulnerable young people into paths of extremism and ultimately terrorism. So th this Islamophobia is very generalizable, but there are also specific individual instances where there are uh, acts of violence targeted against Muslim women, uh, whether here in Europe or elsewhere. And, and it creates a sense that there is somehow uh, an anti-Muslim existence and that, that, that the West isn't a space where Islam is welcome or it belongs. And it then encourages some to look elsewhere for meaning and belonging and ultimately a path to radicalization. But radicalization also has the impact of increasing Islamophobia in the sense that we, we see how uh, Islamist radicalization impacts on far right extremism and the far right use a language of anti-Muslim framing throughout their um, uh, messaging. And, and so Islamophobia has the ability to radicalize both, both, both jihadis and jihadi types, but also the far right. Yeah, that's interesting. So this is what people sometimes call like reciprocal radicalization, right? So how it kind of feeds into each other. So you say Islam, Islamophobia is not only an effect huh, of, of jihadism and for instance, the attacks that we've seen in Europe, but it's also a cause for more radicalization, both for, of potential jihadists, but also the effects on the far, um, far right movements. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yes, absolutely. And and we see local, global, uh, and, and that, of course, national effects here. We see Islamophobia operation operating at the level of, of national discourses around multiculturalism. We see Islamophobia in terms of attacks and vilification and also issues of, of exclusion that are very concentrated. And of course, we still have the global war on terror and the global war on terror culture that's associated with it that exists much more globally. And all these layers uh, are very important in our understanding. And maybe to tie into that um, in relation to the role of, for instance, counterterrorism policies, right? So do you think counterterrorism policies have, have had a positive effect or a negative effect on this whole process uh, or, or Islamophobia? Like what is the relation? And maybe you can give some concrete examples of how counterterrorism policies have played into this whole trend or mechanism that you just uh, sketched for us. Historically, I mean, counterterrorism policies have always had an implication for things like civil, right, uh, civil rights and uh, human rights because of the need of, of urgent solutions uh, for uh, national security. But in the way uh, we framed a lot of the responses to Islamist extremism, it, it sort of almost helped Islamophobia and helped the, the radicalizers' causes because of this overemphasis on religion and ideology and less of an emphasis on the background life stories, including psychological issues that affect people at the everyday level, which is something we're looking at much more now that we're thinking about the far right much more. But it's always been the case for the Islamists, the young jihadis. They, they have vulnerabilities associated with identity, belonging, uh, psychological um, problems that, that needed special attention. But we've sort of bagged it under the need to try and somehow reverse ideology or redirect it in some way. And that, and that, and that assumes that the problems are about uh, these people being Muslims and their Muslimness is, is a route into extremism. And it takes away all the other grievances and, 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 the, sort of, yeah. and the wider historical issues around extremism and terrorism across the world per se. So we, we do have to be very sensitive about, about, about some of this for sure. 
maybe to, to um, add to that, right? I'm always wondering like to what extent is this then also like a very Western issue, right? Because the, the experience you just sketched, like I can imagine this applies a lot to uh, Muslim communities in Western countries, but I was just wondering to what extent does this also hold in uh, Muslim majority countries? Do you also think counterterrorism is framed predominantly through this lens of religion or is the approach very differently there? Is, is this a Western problem kind of, is this a global um, issue? I mean, that's a good point, because if we look at what's going on, and I've been looking at things in the, in, in the Middle East recently for various projects, and there is this focus on understanding the role of religion and, and sectarianism. Places like Iraq, for example, have, uh, have seen deep-seated problems of ethnic, religious, tribal sectarianism for many generations. And then we add various sort of political issues on top of that into the Ba'athist regime under Saddam, and then with the, the uh, invasion and then the consequences today, uh, society is really fragmented and, and it's fraught. So there's a great deal of pressure and emphasis placed on kind of reversing some of those ideological justifications that are made. But underneath all of this sits a very deep, uh, a very, very uh, uh, multi-level uh, structural uh, set of problems around education, employment, curriculum, housing opportunity. In some cases, we've seen radicalization uh, act as a job for people. Um, because it's, it's, it's that much of a push factor rather than simply about wanting to change the world and make it a better place. So uh, yeah, yeah, the, the over, over focus on, on religion is definitely a problem of counterterrorism everywhere. But the particular issues in the, in the Western context is that we've had Muslim minority communities numbering around 35 million now in the post-war period who have faced all sorts of ongoing issues. It's integration, uh, citizenship, belonging, questions of uh, being able to participate, participate in society freely, uh, where there's justice and equality and so on. And these are ongoing issues that have always been there. Yeah. And then you add a very sort of heavy handed, top down um, uh, counterterrorism approach, which doesn't really factor into the into the uh, uh, into those perspectives, any of those historical issues, then you're sort of ignoring all of that. And then you're focusing on on religion and identity, when in fact there are much deeper, wider historical structural problems that are there, that have always been there, but yeah. will never really get uh, attention paid to, which will necessarily mean that in the future there will probably be even more risks uh, of problems because the deeper roots are indeed uh, often structural. Yeah, I think it's very interesting you mentioned how Muslim communities have also turned into a kind of suspect communities that we've also seen in the past in relation to very other communities, for instance, in the UK, in relation to uh, Irish Republican groups that we discuss also these waves of terrorism. Um, but do you think maybe to move a bit more to the to the future, like has there been an increase in, in awareness? For instance, if we look in, um, well, let's take the British context, right, this prevent program, so this counterterrorism program where people can report um, or refer people who they're afraid of might be radicalizing. If we look at these figures, we see that well, for the last few years, there was always a lot of jihadist referrals. But in last years, we see an increase more in right wing extremism and less uh, jihadist referrals. So do you think this is reflecting maybe not only a trend in what is the major threat today? And maybe that might be shifting. But do you think there's also this is also reflecting somehow this more increased awareness of how Muslim communities have become suspect communities and that there's something changing. Like is, is the awareness increasing and do we see these negative effects decreasing or are you maybe not so optimistic about this? What is your view on, on where we're heading right now? Also, uh, Prevent is nearly 20 years old and it, it got a lot of attention paid to it uh, at the beginning because it was seen as a, the front facing aspect of the counterterrorism strategy of the UK government. Um, but it sort of slightly morphed into community-led surveillance and there was a lot of pushback. Reviews were carried out in 2011, but, but the politicized uh, space around it has meant that there's still a very narrow focus, uh, even a focus on countering not just violent extremism, but countering extremism to the extent that any dissent or any, any, any sort of uh, resistance to the dominant political norms are seen as a path to extremism, which is seen as a path to securitization. So these are very much uh, ongoing issues. They haven't really shifted that much. There's still a massive resistance to it uh, in terms of the academic approach and uh, in terms of the community-led approach. There are people who find a way through it. In the end, ultimately, a lot of the initiatives are about empowerment and capacity building and tooling up communities to have a, a greater sense of resistance and resilience from within. Uh, 
Yes, that's important and viable, but not with a conversation that starts with, well, we think that there are people within your communities that need some help. Um, what can you do to help to counter this extremism? Rather than what we can we do to help you to empower yourselves and make yourselves much more uh, yeah. emboldened. Uh, just to elaborate further, recently we completed a study here in, in The Hague about this. And there is also a sense of a securitization and, and a sense of the suspect community paradigm. And it was such the case that when mosque leaders, imams felt that they had some vulnerable cases that they uh, knew or felt suspicious to, in the sense that it could be related to people wanting to travel to Iraq or Syria, rather than reach out to the security intelligence policing services, they tried to fix these problems on their own. And this is because of a lack of trust, because in the past they've been burnt and they've faced over surveillance, they've faced over securitization when they've reached out for help. And, and then of course, um, this, this lack of trust is perpetuated by a very negative political climate as well. Yeah. And so while we have some really good people inside the police intelligence communities, uh, as well as uh, in the civil service, they're fair-minded and very rational. There is the politicization of Muslims and Islam in, in Europe that it frames a lot of the conversation uh, in reality, which has, has the impact of pushing people apart rather than bringing them together. Yeah, thanks. That's very insightful. I think especially like what you say, like we shouldn't approach communities only as a potential threat, right? Or a risk or uh, risks are emanating from the community, but you say empower them more and, and trust them. Um, this is also linked to what we discussed in some other videos, like have trust between communities and authorities. Uh, so I think your message also has uh, is still quite positive in some aspect, right? So um, empower these communities more, trust them more because yeah, you need them um, rather than seeing them as a threat. So thank you for now. I mean, there's a lot more to discuss on this topic, but thanks for sharing your insights um, in this short interview. Uh, you wrote a number of books, right? I yes. think you have some of them that you can show to our viewers at home if, they, if they're interested to read more about your work. Maybe you can Absolutely. Absolutely. show us your books. This came out in 2019. It's an edited collection of essays and papers from uh, colleagues across the world. And we're looking at ways in which Muslims across the world are using Islam as a lens to counter extremism. So volunteering, civil, civil society activism, these are all Islamic principles, charity, uh, community development. So how are they translating Islamic ideals into active uh, resistance? That, 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 uh, uh, and then it's uh, taking attention away from extremism and, and, and Islam and looking at Islam as a route to integration to counter-terrorism even in many ways. But this is the, the book I wrote in 2019 as well, which, which looks at Islamophobia and radicalization, it explores the historical issues of migration, settlement, race, racism, and where we are with Islamophobia on that. And of course, also about counter-terrorism, counter-extremism, uh, de-radicalization, what works and doesn't work, and how sometimes we have strong ideas, strong theories about what seems to work, but without really the evidence. And the result of that is sometimes more problems rather than less. And ultimately, we have to think about uh, solutions that are about structural long-term solutions. And in terms of countering violent extremism, which came out last year, this was an attempt to try and critique the dominant norms around CVE and how we have these very much top-down ideas of uh, what the problems are, what are the solutions to program, using the language of programming and um, using ideas of, of, of measurables, of uh, for various outcomes which are often intangible. Uh, how, do you, how do you measure something that hasn't happened? Uh, the effectiveness of something not happening because of something else happening. <laughs> it's really very difficult, but uh, there is a huge industry around it. And my attempt in this book was just to encourage people to, to, um, to reflect and to think back around, uh, again, wider historical problems and how we need to be talking much more to each other about fighting extremism than just about extremism as the conversation uh, opener itself. We need to talk about belonging, we need to talk about nationhood, we need to talk about equality and integration at, at much wider levels around society as a whole to prevent the risks of extremism. Great. Well, thanks so much for this critical perspective and for the people at home, a lot of stuff to read, a lot of recommendations. We'll also link to them uh, in this video so you can find more information. Uh, but for now, thanks again, Professor Tahir Abbas, for being with us today. Thank you very much.